by um, thanking Leanne for that um, kind introduction and to all of you for um, inviting me to participate in this um, conference. I think give, looking at the agenda, um, I'm going to give you a very um, different, if you like, um, perspective um, on research, research evaluation um, than some of the discussions you're going to have later in the day. So I hope that's useful. I hope it stimulates um, some of your thinking um, and may stimulate um, some ideas for you as a community in going forward and how are you um, going to um, demonstrate the value of what you're doing because that's fundamentally what um, politicians and civil servants right across Europe, North America, um, the globe are increasingly asking research communities um, and in times of austerity and euro crises and financial meltdowns those questions become even sharper in the policy and political um, dialogue. What I'm going to do is to give you a, a brief um, overview of why I think it's important um, to understand research impact. Um, I will then give you two examples, contrasting examples, um, both coming from the biomedical and health sphere. Um, and I'm giving those to you to sort of illustrate some of the methodological complexities, um, but also to illustrate that you can do it if you try. And I think that's quite an important um, message. To, to get across. Um, one point of definition, I, I will use the word impact um, quite a lot. Um, what do I mean by impact? Um, I'll tell you what I don't mean by impact. I don't mean writing a paper in Nature or having a paper cited. Um, to me, that is academic impact. That's when you're having an impact on your academic colleagues. Um, that impact's entirely valid, and there are lots of tools um, for measuring that impact, not least bibliometrics, which works reasonably well in the biomedical um, sciences and in the harder sciences, but less well in the arts and humanities. Um, but I'm not looking at that academic impact. I'm looking at impact beyond the academic system. So as um, people who are largely funded um, by taxpayer euros, dollars, kroners, sterling, um, what are you doing to make society a better place? And that impact can occur in many, many um, different ways. Um, so let me just give you a quick background of RAND Europe um, so you have an understanding of where um, I'm coming from. We're an independent, not-for-profit, public policy research institute. Um, that is a mouthful, but actually it describes us perfectly well. Our communications people always want us to boil that down to one and two words, but I always resist because I think it um, sums us up quite nicely. Um, we have a mission um, which is to help improve policy making through research and analysis. So we're very, very applied when it comes to doing um, research. And I always like to say the single most important word in that mission is help. Um, we, you know, we know that research analysis is not a technocratic solution to policy making, um, but if we can reduce uncertainties in that policy process, in that political dialogue by putting evidence on the table and getting people to engage in that evidence, then we're delivering on our mission. Um, we're part of the Global RAND Corporation, which is a not-for-profit based in the US, but increasingly setting up offices in um, the Middle East and um, most likely in the near future in Asia. Um, we work right across government, so we're very, very broad and multidisciplinary. I think that's one of the unique um, characteristics. So within the 80 people in RAND Europe, we've got people who work on defense and security matters all the way through to healthcare, education, innovation policy, criminal justice, and then that multidisciplinary mix um, drives quite a lot of um, our, our values and, and, and the way we think. Um, but fundamentally, we're, we are a provider of evidence. So um, in sort of the Anglo-Saxon world, at least, um, sort of the concept of evidence-based policy making has had quite a, a long tenure and has been on the rise and, and is, um, doesn't seem to be disappearing. Um, and I quite often say, well, we're the guys who provide that evidence to support evidence-based um, policy making. We support ourselves around a number um, of groups, um, some with a policy focus, some with a methodological focus, and clearly the, what I'm going to be talking about today um, fits into that innovation and technology policy group. Um, so that gives you a feel of where I'm coming from. Let me just give you an outline of where I'm going. Um, I, as I said earlier, I, I will just give you an overview of um, why and how research evaluation is important, um, why measuring research impact is important. Um, I will then give you two case studies. Um, one is in itself has had a massive impact in the UK and beyond. Um, the other has had less impact, um, but I think it's quite an interesting way of thinking how we're going um, forward um, in this domain and then pick up with some lessons and discussions. 
So I like to think, or I like, I, I like to sort of literate, if you like, that um, we evaluate um, research for um, four reasons, um, advocacy, accountability, analysis, and um, allocation. So what do I mean by this? Well, I think every um, chief executive um, of a research funding institution, every vice chancellor of a university um, has their little black book where she or he will be able to go to um, cocktail parties or dinners or events and talk about the impact their agency institution is having on wider um, social, um, on wider society. Um, and that's good. That, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not belittling that. I think it's a really important part of that process. As researchers, we want people representing us at that, um, in, in, within the political economy, if you like. And advocacy is really good. I would argue that when advocacy is even more powerful, when it is driven by analysis and is representative um, in making the case rather than being driven by anecdote. And I worry too much that advocacy is driven by anecdote. Um, accountability um, is um, key. Um, I, I sort of mentioned that already. Um, most of you in this room, I suspect, are, are funded through um, taxpayer um, um, sort of contributions. Um, sometimes um, you may be funded by a um, research charity or through philanthropy. Um, but I don't think the arguments fall down when that occurs. Um, but largely, I think, um, as researchers, as a research community, just as we expect other areas of public life to be accountable for how they um, spend their money as a research community, we have a responsibility um, to be accountable for how we spend money and demonstrate that we provide value for money when spending that money. The issue that I'm really interested in um, is the third A, analysis. What I really would like to understand is what works in research funding. Um, and I think it's slightly ironic when you look at other areas, say education or health, we have a much better understanding of what works and what doesn't work. But when we look at science and research, we have very little understanding of what works and doesn't work. Um, and given what science and research is about, i.e. developing understanding, I, I find that slightly paradoxical. But to illustrate that, we don't really know if it's best to fund research through individuals or through projects. We don't really know whether it's best to have research-only institutes or have um, research and teaching institutes. Um, you know, there is a literature on that, but it's pretty inconclusive. It's pretty small numbered, um, and it sort of lacks an empirical basis on the whole. Um, I can give you exceptions, but I think it's quite a, a weak space. So, what, so one of the things driving um, my group at RAN is really try to develop a, a sort of almost an algorithm. Um, and we, 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 we actually have a formula we put up to scare people. Um, we know it's not a formula, but um, it sort of focuses people's mind when you put up a formula and say, this is how research funding should look. Um, but to really start to understand um, some of those um, um, factors that lead to research success. And I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly. And then the um, fourth one is allocation, which in the UK, um, but nowhere else as far as I know at, at this time, has really gone up the agenda in the last five years. So we've just introduced a new system called the Research Excellence Framework, REF, um, which is um, it's kicked off and it's going to be, um, universities have to submit to this framework um, next year. And 20% of university funding is going to be determined by the impact those universities are having. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's the first time that impact has been used on that scale to drive research funding. And that in itself is creating a whole new set of dynamics within universities. Universities are refocusing their missions around impact. Because we're talking, we're talking, you know, sort of um, over a billion pounds of research funding over a five-year period. We're not talking small numbers here. Um, this has really caught everybody's attention. So that's the why, so the how. Um, there, you know, we have a number of tools to try to evaluate and measure research. I think the key thing is that no one tool is perfect, and any sensible um, bit of research evaluation, bit of impact assessment, will use multiple tools. Um, and I, I think, and I, th I hope I illustrate that um, in the talk, developing some of these methods um, is absolutely key to improving the way we understand the return on research investment. So one tool is benchmarking. Compare yourself to other like institutions, not in the concept, 
context of league tables. We see too many league tables ranking universities. Um, you know, that, that sort of PR stunt. What we really want to do is to rank universities and then have a dis discussion about why is it that I'm number two and you're number three? What are you doing well? What could I improve? It should be driving learning um, rather being, than being a sort of team sport. Um, sometimes you know, university rankings almost feel like the European Championships in football and, and that's got to be quite unhelpful. Um, doing surveys, pretty self-evident, but um, getting information from researchers about what they're doing, and I'll, I'll touch on this. Developing conceptual models, logic models of understanding the research process. Um, this is quite difficult because all the literature um, points out um, correctly that research is not linear, um, but the way research is funded is linear. So how do you sort of create um, conceptual models that allow you to conceptualize how um, sort of non-academic research impacts occur and how to capture those. And I'll illustrate one of those later. Bibliometrics is a, a topic I assume most of you are reasonably familiar with. Um, so how do you measure um, citations on, on research papers? But going beyond that, I, and I think this is something um, of relevance to you, how, how do we measure citations on other types of documents? Um, so through sort of Web of Science and Scopus, we got that community around sort of formalized peer review publications pretty well tied down, but increasingly, um, people are interested in measuring citations on clinical guidelines or citations in policy documents. Um, so how do we capture that in a systematic way that allows us to um, really um, undertake um, detailed analysis? Um, case studies, I think, um, are really important. And I have to say, I come from a more quantitative bent, so for me to be saying that is um, not unimportant. Um, so we, we do a lot of case studies, and I think case studies in this area really allow you to get to the um, sort of texture on the research process. Those issues of serendipity, those issues of culture and values, which are so, so important um, for successful research, or seem to be very important for successful research. And we find when we're um, examining that fourth A, third A analysis, um, case studies tend to be the most powerful tool um, that we have. Um, economic analysis, I'm gonna give you an example of that. Um, so I won't um, comment on that too much. And then peer review, which again, um, everybody in this room would be familiar with, but asking our peers, do you think this is high quality research? Do you think this is high impact research? So, so we have the tools, they need to be improved, they need to be integrated, um, but we have a, a toolkit. So you can um, sort of group those um, sort of um, why and how um, questions in a matrix and the point here is that um, different approaches um, have different um, requirements from a sort of toolkit methodological perspective. And what I'm going to do because of um, time constraints um, and because I want to drop into some depth, I'm only going to focus on two of those A's. Um, I will briefly touch on the other two A's, but if anybody wants to discuss those, um, I'm very happy to do so. So let me just give you um, my key messages. I'll repeat this at the end, um, but I always like to um, put up my key messages um, early on in case um, you, you need a nap or fall asleep or whatever. Um, so I like to um, um, stress to people that you really need to understand why you're measuring research. What is your objective? So if you're sitting with a research funder and they've invited us in um, to evaluate their research program, we spend a lot of time going through those A's with them because that will drive the methodology. Um, so if they want something which is going to be evidence-driven advocacy, it's a very, very different approach than if they want to um, allocate research funds. Um, and, it's, and really understanding um, the motivation for um, research impact um, assessment is key. Now that doesn't mean that they are mutually exclusive, but it's, it's a matter of kind of ranking those um, four A's to find out where, where they're at. Um, use a multi-method, multi-dimensional approach. Um, I've just illustrated a series of methods. Um, multi-dimension, I've implied um, at, so what do I mean by uh, multi-dimension? Well, there, there is academic impact. We should definitely be looking at academic impact, but there's non-academic impact, and we don't spend enough time looking at non-academic impact. There's impact on people's careers, um, training, PhDs, postdocs. Um, there's impact on publications and knowledge production. Um, there's impact on health. So, so we, 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 you know, what, whenever you go into an evaluation, think about the different dimensions of impact, um, and that multi-dimensional approach, I think, is useful. Um, I think it's fair to say acknowledge that it's not easy measuring research and impact. Um, I don't think anybody's got the answer. Um, but at the same time, you can't say 
it's too difficult and move away. I, I just don't think that's um, a legitimate argument. Um, and I would argue um, and have argued that we need to move away from the um, prime reason of doing this um, around advocacy, um, where um, senior leadership in the research um, community are making the case for research. Um, I'm not, be, you know, I, I don't want to belittle that, but we need to move away from that. that you know, that's too often the driver for this, to one where it's about um, accountability, about where researchers can really demonstrate to society the value they're bringing, um, and the benefit of that I, I think is really strong. Um, so it, you know, there's whole. Um, debates in, in other forums about sort of issues of public understanding of science and, um, and what have you. And I think if people, you know, people as in um, sort of non-researchers, have a better understanding of the research process and how complicated research is and non-predictive it is, the role of serendipity, the role of um, sort of accidental outcomes, um, the easier it is to generate general support around research rather than this it's very deterministic approach that we kind of apply um, to the public understanding of science today. Um, so those are my key messages. Um, let me move on to my um, first um, exemplar. And this is a report we did um, collaboratively with three groups in the UK, um, published there about four years ago. Um, and the, the, the other two groups are the Health Economics Research Group at Brunel University and the Office of Health Economics, um, which focuses on private sector R&D funding. Um, the background to this study is that um, there are a series of um, reports coming out um, first in the US, then in Australia um, in 2003 that looked at the quote unquote economic returns from biomedical and health research. And these um, returns were extraordinary. Yeah, you can see the numbers up here. Um, as I like to say, if I was investing in my pension fund and I saw these numbers, I'd put all my money in biomedical and health research. I haven't, but that's what you would do if you see these returns. Um, and we as a group were very critical of the methodology of both of those studies, and I'll come back and explain that in, in more depth. Um, and we're delighted when the UK Academy of Medical Science put out a report um, in 2006 that said that research funders should support research to assess the economic impact on medical research. So Martin Buxton, who's the professor at HERG, the Health Economics Research Group at Brunel, and myself, um, clearly um, were very keen to do this, went to the AMS and they put out a, a tender which we bid for and won, um, which is kind of scary when you've been criticizing other people's work and then you have the opportunity to show them how to do it. And you you kind of set yourself up. Um, but it was, it was good fun. So what, what did we do? Um, and this is, um, you know, this is the study in one slide, um, which conceptualized what we did. And, and the detail behind this is, is, is phenomenal. Um, effectively, what we needed to do was estimate four bits of information. Um, we needed to estimate how much money was spent on research. We needed to understand on, on biomedical and health research. Um, we need to understand what the health gain is from that research. We need to understand what the economic spillover is from that research. So um, I have no idea um, whether at DTU this is the case, but there may be a science park close by. Um, and that may be a spillover from having a university situated here. So that's generating additional economic benefit, which it was not the direct objective of the R&D funding. In Cambridge, we definitely see that. It's very clear that around Cambridge, we have a number of biotech um, type companies and they have spun out of the university um, and are generating economic wealth um, for, for that area. Um, so we need to estimate what that economic spillover is. And crucially, um, and one of the things that um, the Australian and US study forgot to do um, was to understand what the time lag between input and output or outcome is. So in their studies, they assumed it was instantaneous. So you know, I give you 100,000 pounds worth of research funding and you give me some health gains immediately. Well, that's just nonsensical, but that was the underlying assumption. So I'll go through each of those um, four data points. So we focused in on cardiovascular and mental health research as, as two areas to, to look at. We chose cardiovascular for two reasons. We had done a lot of work in cardiovascular in the past, so we had a good understanding 
of um, research developments in the history of R&D and cardiovascular research. Um, and secondly, the data in cardiovascular is pretty good quality. And, and again, we understood the, the limitations of the data. We chose mental health because we really wanted to stress test our model because mental health was a nightmare. That, you know, if you look at the um, health gains in mental health, they're pretty poor. Um, you look at the investment in mental health, it, it, it's mediocre. Um, and the data is, 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 you know, the definitional issues and there's just lack of data as well. So we did mental health to stress test the approach. I'm going to focus on cardiovascular, um, but just to illustrate that. So we built up this um, time series of cardiovascular research spend um, from 1975 to 1992. We chose 1975 because we knew we had to go back a long way because it's a time lag issue. We didn't know what the time lag was when we started collecting the data. Um, and 1975 was a good break point um, for one of the, um, the MRC, the Medical Research Council data series, because they shifted data definitions in 1975. Um, we've actually got the data set going back to 1917, um, and I have a research at the moment compiling that time series. Um, but um, in terms of the modeling, um, we could um, stop at 1975. Um, I have to say, you know, especially um, speaking to an audience like yourselves, um, that so the data archiving of this information was an absolute nightmare. Um, we, we had a um, researcher um, spend two weeks um, in the archives of the Medical Research Council hand extracting out this R&D spend. Um, and this is 1975. Um, so, you know, just a plea, you know, for me, capturing this information um, in a digital form would be great. Um, so that, that's, and, and the, the different lines here are probably of less interest, but you know, obviously different funders um, fund cardiovascular research. And, and in the report, we go into a lot of detail of how we um, estimated that and the assumptions. We had to make quite a lot of assumptions and we're very transparent on that. But our, our best um, estimate, as we like to call it, was um, between 1975 and 1992, um, UK public and charitable funding was around two billion pounds. Um, the second issue was then we needed to understand those health gains. Um, first issue, which is another critique of the US and Australian study, is we couldn't look at all health gains. One thing we could do is just look at the improvement in cardiovascular morbidity and mortality over a period of time. Um, but what we were keen on doing is ensuring that those health gains were actually driven by research. So um, some of those health gains are more social. Um, we're living better housing, um, people may be doing more exercise, maybe eating better, whatever um, the issues are. Um, so we were lucky in the cardiovascular case, not so in the mental health case, and we're just about to do the same for um, oncology, and we don't have that there. But in the cardiovascular case, there was a previous study which identified the most important research-based interventions that have led to health gains in cardiovascular disease. And then we quantified those using an indicator called Qualies, which is a quality-adjusted life year, um, which basically is, a, is an indicator used by health economists. It's pretty accepted in the health economics um, field, but as a non-health economist, it makes you slightly uncomfortable um, because what it's saying is um, you know, how many additional years of quality life do you get from stopping smoking, say. I mean, that's the simplest answer, or taking statins, or whatever, and we did a massive literature review and compiled all that data um, to estimate the quality gains, um, as you can see here. We then um, monetized those um, quality gains, um, saying that each quality was worth 25,000 pounds. Now, again, you say, why 25,000 um, pounds? That is the number that the National Health Service uses in the UK to determine whether a treatment is cost effective or not. And again, one of the differences between our study and other studies in the US and Australia was that they used a higher threshold. And we, we did a whole lot of sensitivity analysis changing the 25,000 pounds and other bits, but we used that 25,000 pounds. So we had 2.8 million qualities, um, quality adjusted life years. We gave a value of each of those to 25,000 pounds. Um, you get 69 billion pounds from that. And then, crucially, um, there's a cost to delivering healthcare. So new innovation is not cost-free. Um, new pharmaceuticals are usually more expensive than the old generics. Um, so we had to estimate what the costs were. We estimated the cost to be 16 billion pounds. So we, we estimated a health gain worth 53 billion pounds compared to our investment of two billion pounds. Now, we, don't, we haven't dealt with time lags yet, so don't get too excited, but you, you're starting to get a feel. 
you know, we're talking billion pounds. Those are big numbers. We had big confidence intervals around this in our sensitivity analysis as well. Um, so then we get on to um, looking at the time lag. Um, and we estimated the time lag to be 17 years. And we did that by um, looking at the um, knowledge cycle time, as we called it, between yeah, on clinical guidelines. So that is the, what is the median um, year of a paper cited on a clinical guideline compared to the publication of the clinical guideline. It's a technique that's used quite a lot in patent analysis and we applied it to clinical guidelines. We found out that that, 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 that was 2.5 years for clinical guidelines and then we knew um, that there was a period between spending and publication. So you, know, you get a research grant, it takes two to three years for you to start to publish and there's going to be a period between the clinical guideline being published and it being implemented by clinicians. So again, we estimated, guesstimated a time lag of 17 years, and then we flex that in our sensitivity analysis. As an aside, we've just um, published a paper doing a review on these time lags, and there are four other studies, um, including this one, um, which come up with 17 years using very, very different methodologies, um, which, which and, and the title of the, the, the paper is, the answer is 17 years, what is the question? Um, so, some of you may know where we nick that from. Um, so we took that 17 year time lag, and then the fourth component is to understand what the spillovers are. Now, measuring economic spillovers from an econometric point of view is really, really challenging, and we didn't have the resources to do that as part of this study. We've just put in a, a grant to hopefully do that um, next year. Um, so we did a literature review on what are the um, spillover effects and basically took the um, best estimate from that um, literature review, which was around 30%. There, there are major problems with that um, 30% because the literature is, is A, it's quite old, um, B, it's US dominated, and C, it's largely around agricultural research. So we're, we're making an assumption that we can translate that and put that in our model, um, and you can critique that, and it'd be a fair critique. So anyways, we come up with a internal rate of return of 39%, which is a lot less, but good. So, you know, again, you'd invest on the stock market if you knew you were gonna get a return of 39%, but it's a lot less than 500%, which is what our Australian friends um, concluded. So why? Why, why, why do we have these fundamental um, differences? Um, first thing is both um, the US and the Australian studies took a top-down approach. So they looked at all mortality and morbidity gains. We did a approach that focused on research-based interventions. So we identified from the literature these 13 research-based interventions where you could be very confident that the research led to the gain and not some other social um, dynamic. Um, that means we're being conservative because they, there's stuff missing, um, but they, they were being whatever the opposite of conservative is. And the, the bit that always got me was this bit here. So that they acknowledged that not all of those um, health gains could be attributed to R&D. And in the report, it then goes, so we don't know what it is, so we're going to assume it's 50%. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's literally a verbatim quote. Um, they, as I've already mentioned, did not include a time lag. So they assumed that those um, investments are instantaneous. Um, they did not net off the healthcare costs. We netted off 16 billion pounds estimate of healthcare costs. And we used a lower value, statistical value of a life, a lower value for a quality. They didn't use the quality approach, they used the value of a statistical life, which is another way um, in stats and statistics of valuing life. But their um, value was effectively three times higher than our value. And what we found is that when you um, actually um, undertook our model um, and made all these assumptions, we actually come out at roughly 500% as well, which I think is quite interesting. It, you know, so so the, the, the date, there was um, convergence around the data, um, but it was kind of the, the, the assumptions and the methodologies, um, I would argue, we improved um, in this approach. So let me just talk briefly about the impact of that, because I think in the UK, um, it has had a major impact, and an impact that... Um, as a research group, we find quite uncomfortable at times because people have overused um, the magic 39%. Um, 
You know, I now go to meetings where people re tell me that the return from cardiovascular research is 39%. And I go, really? You know, did you read chapter eight with all the caveats? Um, did you look at the sensitivity analysis? Um, and um, but it had an impact. And I think it had an impact because it was a number. Um, you know, and that works in the political economy. And you know, that's fair enough. I, I understand that. Um, it had an impact because I think it was rigorous. Um, you know, I, I know I'm saying that, but if you read the report, every assumption is backed up. Every, every bit of data is in there. Um, so I think that's really um, crucial. So people could go in. Um, so the former um, chief executive of the Medical Research Council is one of the people who commissioned it, and he's now the vice chancellor of Cambridge University. Um, I met him a couple of months ago, and he actually was saying to me that you know the best thing about that is the fact that um, I may disagree with you, but I know why I disagree with you. Um, and I think again, in the space of science policy, um, when people want advocacy, it's too easy to provide the five. 100% return as an advocacy tool without really thinking about what you're doing and the robustness of that. And I think that adds to the, the power of the study. This quote here um, comes from our science minister, David Willett. Um, so in the UK, we had a spending review when the new um, coalition government came in. Um, and that spending review um, looked right across what government was spending um, in all areas, you know, education, defense, health, research. And the one area that was protected was biomedical and health R&D. So I would argue, um, partly at least because of this study, um, I'd also next time suggest that we just take a percent of that saving rather than the contract that we were paid, um, make us very wealthy. But, um, and then the other thing which has a research group which really um, we liked was this quote here, um, which was in an editorial in nature, um, and that's referring to, to this study. So you, know, you can put that on my gravestone, that, 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 that works for me. So that, that's um, economic returns, a very um, you know, um, different approach to measuring research impact, um, but really interesting from a methodological viewpoint. Um, difficult, challenging, um, lack of data, developing the methods, developing the conceptual framework. Um, and I believe um, really has sort of um, helped UK science a lot, but also driven an agenda on how we do this better. Um, so let me move on to something slightly different where I don't think we've been as successful, um, and, I, and I can discuss why. Um, but I, I, I think is an interesting approach when trying to understand um, research impacts, again, beyond academic re impacts into social, economic, um, societal impacts. Um, this is a piece of work we did a number of years ago for the arthritis um, research campaign as was now called Arthritis um, UK, a medical um, charity in the UK, clearly funds arthritis research, but very much from the, the basic um, bench side type stuff all the way um, to the more clinical applied um, bed, so from bench to bedside as people like to say. Um, they are the fourth largest um, funder in, a charitable funder in the UK, um, one of the largest um, funders of arthritis research in Europe. Um, at that time, they're spending about 25 million pounds a year on arthritis research, and, and most of that money is, well, nearly all of that money is raised from donations and legacies. Um, and they, um, we, we, we had done a preceding study for them, which was case study based, um, which they found very helpful and very useful. Um, but the chief executive at the time came to us and said, you know, we really like that case studies, but we can't do case studies on every single project we fund. We, you know, we just can't afford that. It's going to be too much. Is there any way you can operationalize this thinking and come up with a way which is going to allow us to capture and measure our impact, um, but is relatively cheap and doable and feasible from an operational perspective? Um, and the other thing which we had identified for them, and, but they were well aware of, and lots of research funders are aware of this, is they required all their grant holders to submit end of grant reports. Um, I suspect a number of you have submitted end of grant reports in your life. Um, but the point is research funders never read them. Yeah, so it's a complete waste of time and effort, um, both from the researcher perspective and the research funder perspective. Um, and so they were thinking of um, saying, basically coming up with a deal with their research community, saying we're not going to require you to um, do end of grant reports anymore, but what we do want to do is to follow you over a period of time, because we know that the impact you're going to have is going to take more than that period of when you file the end of grant report, which is usually within a year. So it could go out five years. So they came up with a deal with their research community where they effectively, they said, if you want to get follow-on funding from us, 
you're going to have to answer our survey at um, one year, 18 months, five years, and potentially beyond that, that they've gone out um, to those periods. So they get surveyed after five years to understand what the research impact of their research funding is. Um, so what we did is we, we worked with, um, in a qualitative sense, with 40 ARC researchers, took the case study research and tried to sort of break that up into um, a web-based questionnaire, which could be completed within 30 minutes, that was exclusively yes-no questions. Um, and basically asked, have you had this impact? Has your work been cited on a clinical guideline? Have you um, done any work in a local school? Have you talked about your research at a local school? Um, have you briefed your local hospital on, um, you know, your local hospital board on, on the research? Have you appeared in the media? Um, so really, you know, yes, no, so that's why it's quick to fill. Um, and, and those 187 questions came from the case study work and working with those 40 um, researchers. We've now taken that 187 up to 220, because every time we do more work, we add to that list. But the point is, it's yes, no. Um, and we know that when people fill in this survey, the vast majority of them, like 70%, um, I think it is, fill it in within 30 minutes, which is kind of where, what we're aiming for from a threshold point of view. So what we did is then we broke down the um, types of research impact into these um, five categories, which is based on something called the payback framework, which um, colleagues at um, Health Economics Research Group developed in, I think the first paper is 1996. And they identify these five different um, types of research impact. Um, the first two, if you like, are academic impacts, and the last three are more the wider impacts in terms of society um, and, and um, social change. So we, we identified those, uh, we took those um, um, categories to put in those 187 questions, because you can't just throw 187 questions at people. You need to sort of root them through answering that. Um, so if I focus in on research targeting and capacity building, we then you sort of drop into that, and then um, there's another set of quite simple questions. You know, um, did it lead to further funding? Was there interactions with industry? Um, did it develop any um, research tools? Um, did you interact with academia? So drop into that. Um, have you had initial discussions about collaboration and formal knowledge exchange? Yes, no. Um, did these fundings lead to a co-application for funding? Yes, no. Um, were they successful? Yes, no. Um, so again, you, you're getting an illustration. So we have, you know, you sort of get rooted into answering these questions. So you don't necessarily answer all 187, which again is, a, is an important point. So we then um, allow people to obviously answer them. We gave it a color code, which should become um, self-evident. And what you can then do is you take a grant, um, twist it around, build up a whole lot of grants, and build up this, um, what we termed an impact array, um, which is great because it looks good. Um, but the um, really interesting point of it is that we're now developing a database of multiple research grants and multiple types of research impact, which means that we can start correlating and doing statistical analysis, multiple regression type analysis across this data set. And that's going to be the um, crucial thing. Um, it's still kind of in development, but we're, we're getting there. Um, this was used, or a version of it was used by the National Institutes of Health Research in the UK, um, the largest funder of um, clinical and applied research in the UK. So all their um, grant holders now have to fill in this questionnaire on an annual basis. Again, it updates so that the, 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 the surveys remember what they said last year, so they don't have to repeat what they said last year, but they can develop it if impacts have um, occurred. Um, and these are some very um, recent um, bits of data um, that allows you to just describe um, what is going on. Um, so the, the colors here are different types of research funding, um, and these are different types of um, impact. So here you can see, if you like, in total, there's a, a, you know, there were 180-odd um, PhDs who were supported um, by this stream of research funding. Probably more interesting is, um, you know, you look over here, you've got a small number of patents, but, you know, before they didn't know how many patents um, were being captured. And probably more interesting, I think, is, is this graph here, where we start to look at the um, impact over time um, of different research grants. So, so we, we, we know, if you like, and this is getting down to health policy impacts. So this is if you're in the National Institutes of Health Research, you want to have an impact on health policy. That's got to be your mission. Um, so we know that um, after around 10 years now, 12% of their grants is having some type of impact on health research. We never knew that. Nobody ever knew that number. We don't know if that's a good number or a bad number, but at least we have one number 
uh, which we can start comparing it with. Um, so th th this is um, very much um, work in progress, um, but is an approach we've been trying to take where we can basically um, sort of disaggregate impact in a series of data points and build up data sets that then allow us and others to interrogate those to try to understand what that mythical equation I talked about in the introduction um, could look like. Um, and that repeats that. And in one sense, this, this um, tool is now being used by some others. The MRC does something a bit similar. Um, it's based um, on this. Um, I mentioned NIHR, and we've worked with some guys in, in, in Canada and what have you. But I think, it, in one sense, it's not the tool, but it's this conceptual approach of disaggregating impacts from case studies um, and trying to then collect um, data around that. Um, so I've talked about those two um, pieces of work, um, advocacy and accountability. Let me just focus for a couple of minutes on analysis and allocation, but I won't go into depth. I just have one slide on this. I mentioned um, how important case study research is, um, and it's really useful and really important for the analysis um, of research impacts, and that, that's getting to what factors lead to research success. And what we've done a series of studies in, um, arthrit in arthritis, um, in cardiovascular research, and we're doing a big one now in, in mental health research, is to develop um, case studies over a 20-year period. So we go back 20 years to when the research funding occurred and then build up this narrative about what happened to that research funding, speaking to all the people. So it's, it's a semi-historical um, analysis, and we build up these uh, narratives um, to a very um, um, tight structure so we can compare across them. And we, we, for the um, original arthritis one, we had 16 case studies. For the cardiovascular one, we had about 30 case studies, which for case study research of this depth is a, is a large number. As a statistician, that, I thought that was a small number, but um, it, it is a relatively large number for case study research. Um, and then what you can do is that you can, we then basically bring together a panel um, of peer reviewers to rate those case studies on different dimensions of impact. So we quantify those case studies. And then we undertake an analysis where we um, look at um, the sort of um, the, the quantified impact on different dimensions and compare it to the qualitative information in the case studies to see if we can start to identify some of these um, factors that are associated with both high impact and low impact. So I'll give you a couple of examples to illustrate that. Um, one area that we um, increasingly find, and it won't be surprising, um, is the um, impact of collaboration. Um, so the more teams collaborate, the greater the impact of their research. And again, I'm talking about non-academic impact. So we kind of know that from bibliometric data, but this is verifying that from a more social economic um, perspective. Um, some of the more interesting observations is that um, tentatively, in a, in a recent report, we don't quite have the numbers to, to put our money on it, but there's been a practice amongst smaller um, research funders, largely charities, um, that they will take what the large national body doesn't fund. So, um, you know, the, the Medical Research Council will rate all the grants. It funds the top 10%. Um, so you assume the percent, the next decile is pretty good quality, and they then get handed over to the research charities. This was effectively policy um, in Australia, and we found when that occurred, it was actually associated with lower impact. Um, so from a policy point of view, that's probably not a good idea, but, it, you know, but there was a lot of rationale and sense. Why do we duplicate the transaction costs, if you like, in the peer review process? Um, so I, I, I find that area um, fascinating, and then the whole what's driving that is to help inform the research policy of research funders and to make them um, more effective and more efficient at, at what they undertake. The second area is allocation, um, and I mentioned this um, earlier. The, in the UK, we have the research excellence framework, um, which is going to allocate 200 million pounds a year over five years, a billion pounds, based on the impact researchers are having in a higher education institute. And the way that's going to um, pan out is through peer review. So researchers um, are having to write case studies of the impact of their research. And those case studies, which are about four to five pages long, then go through to a peer review committee and they will get rated. Um, and they get rated on their significance, the significance of their re impact, and the reach of the impact, how many people it affected. We're doing lots of work trying to um, help um, 
UK universities think through those. How, you know, how, you know, how do you identify impact in your institution? Um, it's not as easy as it sounds. And then how do you strengthen those case studies? So, so we're undertaking critical reviews um, on behalf of some universities in the UK, which for us is great because we're getting to see all this stuff which we wouldn't otherwise see. Um, so I think it's really interesting that um, you know, that sort of case study allocation approach is at least being tried out. I think it's fair to say it's an experiment. We, nobody knows whether it's going to work. But what I find really exciting, and I think, again, something which may be pertinent to you guys, is when this is done, there are going to be something like 5,000 of these case studies. So we can find a way of data mining those case studies and starting to tease out some of these factors associated with success. That, you know, that's much more powerful, actually, than the survey tool that we originally developed, which we started thinking about before REF really came on the scene. Um, so I think there's a really exciting um, opportunity there to, to start thinking through how you would um, data mine these 5,000 impact statements, which will be ranked. So you know some will be high, some will be low, some will be mid. Um, and then seeing whether you can identify common factors associated, say, with the high impact case studies in humanities or history. Um, all of this I've talked about is around the biomedical sciences. The great thing about REF for us is that we're being exposed to other disciplines, and it's great having a discussion with a historian about their impact. Because they, you know, they come in and think, well, I don't have impact. But actually, when you start having a discussion with um, people, they do have impact. It's helping people think about the impact they're having. Um, so that's um, so my, I'll just move on to lessons and discussion. I'm very happy to take um, questions. Um, so to just sum up, so I um, hopefully um, got across that research evaluation requires um, multiple tools. But um, I think good evaluation is about sort of weaving this um, tapestry in a coherent tapestry. So it's about bringing these different tools together and not relying on a single tool. And that's kind of why it makes it different, because you need multidisciplinary um, teams to, to, to make that happen. So to repeat my key messages, I hope I've got across that you um, need to know why you're measuring the, the impact, why you're measuring or evaluating research. What is the objective of the research evaluation? I hope I've got across that you must take a multi-dimensional, um, multi-method approach. Um, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. I think that's a really important um, point to get across. And as a community, I think we need to move away from the advocacy position we've been in for almost a generation when it comes to um, thinking about research impact to one where the science of science allows us to understand what works um, we need a practical evidence base for science policy makers. Um, and I think the science policy community kind of needs to um, walk the talk. Um, as I said in the introduction, it's slightly paradoxical that research and science is about improving understanding, and we don't really understand how to fund research and science. Um, so on that note, I'm happy to take any questions.